Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our webinar series, Embracing Change. We've got an incredible trio with us today. There we go. It's like a rollout, red carpet. So we've got uh, Philip, as uh, some of you have been watching some of the webinars we did together. We've got Iraj, who should be here with us shortly. And we've got Kenneth, incredible. So two people sitting in London and one sitting in Singapore. So thank you, all three of you. Thank you for taking the time and being with us tonight uh, for some, I guess, still morning. And, um, you know, to talk about a topic which I know you guys are very passionate about. You've about to, you're finalizing writing your article and the mini book. And so it'd be really amazing first, you know, um, to begin and say, how did this all begin? And what is this about? Like, what's, what's really going on? Like, you know, just give us a little bit of background so we can kind of get into your space, into your, into your, we say the weather, and then let's understand the climate of what's happening, you know, because we've got, you know, the leading family advisor, we've got Iraj, who's, you know, from a hundred year old, is that a hundred years or even more Iraj? hundred years, right? 200. 200 year old business. Sorry. Sorry. Rounding error. Uh, <laughs> Kenneth, academically, that's a rounding error, right? Kenneth, uh, for those of us who failed math. And then we've got Kenneth from academia sitting in Singapore. So we've got incredible, you know, three perspectives. So Philip, why don't you just guide us and try to have us understand like what, what's what's going on how, how did this how did this come about sure so so let me please i'll give you a little bit of a nutshell of how we began thinking about this topic and a little bit about you know kind of who we are in a sense uh, as a as a group of uh, three friends uh, working on this uh, project and uh, i think it'll be a good segue for you to then uh, get some further insight from both iraj and, and kenneth to then get us going on a, on what i hope is an, an interesting discussion um, as you know, and uh, from the other webinars we've done together and otherwise, um, you know, I'm a lawyer by background, uh, having worked with families from around the world. And uh, in the last years, I've been more and more involved in teaching, working with governments, uh, looking at, at the issues in our society about inequality and tax systems and all of these other areas. And a number of years ago, I wrote a book about how in my view, at least, wealth destroys families. Wealth, yeah. uh, you know, uh, I wrote a book called The Destructive Power of Family Wealth. <laughs> and I've been very concerned as I work with families from around the world uh, about all of these issues. Uh, these are concerns that I've shared over many years with both Kenneth and Iraj, uh, friends of mine and collaborators in a variety of areas. Uh, we teach together, we do all kinds of things, um, you know, together. Um, and all of this um, led to... Iraj and I, particularly a number of years ago, working with uh, Cambridge University, uh, unlike me, Iraj is a graduate of Cambridge, and uh, uh, he, through his connections at Cambridge, uh, we began working with uh, the business school at Cambridge, and we introduced a program on the responsible ownership of wealth um, and, and what this really means, and we were doing that at the business school, and more recently, and Iraj can fill you in on, on that, we're working with the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership in relation to how wealth and business owning families can contribute to a more sustainable world. And that's really the, the link here okay. to the ideas that we've been working on, because uh, in the world of sustainability, of course, the focus of families is to talk about how do we contribute to minimizing climate change? How do we contribute yeah. to environmental and other issues? And Many of you may have heard of the term, the circular economy. Uh, in other words, you know, in manufacturing processes and otherwise, circularity means you know, focus very well on not only ensuring that you're not wasting resources, but you're actually getting the most out of the resources you have, that you're, you're doing everything in a circular kind of way. This led the three of us to begin to talk about these principles why can we not apply them to the families themselves? And very simply put, if a family wants to contribute to sustainability over generations, unless that family itself is sustainable, that's not going to work. 
And as we began talking and thinking about these things, we became very excited. I know we get excited about very simple things, but we got very, very excited about how these principles actually transform the way families relate, think, work, how their family constitutions work, how shareholders agreements work, how you deal with the problems that every family confronts. And so we're getting very excited about where all of this can go. So you're telling me that this one shift of reflecting into the family is impacting all of those pieces of the puzzle and challenging Absolutely. it? Absolutely. And, and our whole, and, and I'll, I'll let you hear from, from the others, but our whole approach, and, and we've, we've done some initial writing on this, but our whole approach is we feel that we're at the beginning of a journey of thinking about this area. And one of the things we'd very much appreciate to hear from you and also from those participating in, in this webinar are ideas and thoughts about how we can take this in different directions, because for us, it's intellectually interesting. Well, I don't know. You guys are also advising. You're also um, in a room full of families like the ones that are that are attending, right? But it, that's amazing. So you're basically giving us hope that family longevity will go to the next level, as we say, inshallah, with this whole new ideology that you want to bring into practice. Viraj? Yes, so Faisal, thank you. And I, I, I think we we are if we think about where the world is today yeah. we are we're in a world facing system shocks and so the fact that families may have survived to this point is certainly no guarantee that that, that will actually lead them to a successful outcome in the future so this absolutely is the time to reflect and simply make the most of what the family has whether it's financial assets, natural capital, human capital, it's all of it together, social capital. And thinking about it on, as you know, as Philip indicated, it's, it's, this is thinking about it on an integrated basis is essential. And it requires an element of, it requires a conversation within the family because actually very simply, and for everyone on the, on the call today, a sustainable mindset starts at home. That's really where it starts. It's not something that's just happening in the business or just happening in the good work you do in the community. Yeah. It needs to be joined up. And I think that's really very much the approach that we've taken in the work that Philip and I started at Cambridge. And I, I edited a book earlier this year on responsible wealth ownership and very much with you preparing the next generations okay. for, for this world ahead, which is full, which is full of not only disruption from technology, there's more conflict in the world than before, there's a connection of climate and conflict, many issues which we need to really think through, and which actually may require a different element of leadership. So let me pause there, and, and Kenneth, maybe you'd like to jump in. So just, yeah, before you go in, so, so obviously you used a word that's in our tagline, integrate. So it's going to be interesting. I'd like to kind of go into that when time permits, right? To understand the integrated piece within this circular economy. Is it the humans? Is it the processes? Is it the mindset? Is it the, like what is, how is it gonna be integrated? Because that's what, I mean, for 16 years, I'm living, breathing on the health and well-being side. And one of them is the relational side, which is what you're referring to, to leverage and take the game to the next level. So I wanna put that part, but let's not forget it because that's, that's kind of, you know, the juice flowing. So sure. thank you, Raj. Kenneth. Hi, Faisal. Thanks, thanks for having us here. Um, when you introduce us as the amazing trio, um, I wasn't sure who you were referring to then, so it took <laughs> us a while to, to log on and thought, wait, is there someone else here? <laughs> I had a choice to call you the three musketeers, but I thought that might not be, you know. <laughs> <laughs> three, three, three amigos, yeah. Three amigos, yes. Um, so and anyway, thanks. Um, uh, I mean, so you know, I, I think this is my first time here, so I just do a you know very short introduction. You know, I'm yes. uh, assistant professor of strategic management at SMU uh, in Singapore. That's a Singapore management uh, university, um, and. Um, uh, the other hat that I wear is as the academic director of the uh, Business Families Institute. Um, so at SMU, a couple of things I look after will be the entrepreneurship program, and I do a, a bit of work in uh, sustainability as well. Um, on the personal side, I'm also a member of a, a third-generation family business. We're also going through some of these issues 
um, around governance and succession, coming up with the family um, uh, 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 council and, and things like that. Um, and I bring this up because it gives you the setting for where I was thinking and how uh, you know, we, we, we came up with this project. Um, and, and how I ended up working together with Philip and Iraj. Um, otherwise, people would think that we found each other on Tinder, um, which maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Philip, not a not not a good reputation to add to the list. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> but, um, um, so 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 I was thinking about this. You know, I'm thinking about sustainability. I'm thinking about families. I'm thinking about entrepreneurship. And then, uh, you know, at the BFI, we had an event with Philip and Iraj on a political risk, and that's where they were talking about the benefits of having that diversity in the family and how that might contribute to um, uh, 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 ensuring or protecting yourself against um, yeah. a political risk. So those ideas were kind of floating around. And then they approached me um, to talk about uh, with this idea about the circular economy principles and uh, uh, family succession and governance. And like you, right, exactly like the question that you had was, what's enabling it? Like we know about these principles, we know about how to apply these principles into a particular domain, but what's, why is it so difficult to embrace it or, or, or to translate it into practice? Uh, and, and so for me that, that, you know, where the point of change or the level of, of change or action was, uh, was in the mindset was, was, you know, it starts at the individual, right? It's how people think. And then it translates into um, uh, uh, something at the organization of, or, or the collective level, right? That's where the culture and the values come into the picture, right? But the question that I had was, all right, what's that mindset that requires that require us to um, accept and embrace some of these ideas? And for me, that was uh, uh, paradox thinking. And this, this idea of paradox thinking is something that is, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, becoming more popular in the areas of sustainability because in, uh, uh, in that space, we're talking about how organizations can make a profit and create impact at the same time, right? And that's where the paradox thinking comes in the picture. And so in the same way, when I was thinking about, well, how do we embrace the circular economy principle or circularity principles in the domain of family succession and governance? I was like, yeah, I think paradox, this, you know, embracing this paradox thinking can, bring us a step closer towards being more accepting of this, uh, 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 of these principles. Thank you. Thank you, Kenneth. So let's, if, if you don't mind, let's go really, really basic, right? So you've explained, I think Philip's explained a little bit about what that even means, the circular economy as in context. And we've got all these pieces that, that you spoke to, right? And talked about integration. Now you're talking about mindset. Yeah. So if it's okay with you guys, look, you can, you can, you know, rail me somewhere else. Don't worry. Okay. I'm just here with you is how does it begin? Like, can, can you walk us through, like, how, how would we begin this process with a family? If, if we're able to go practical or do you want to discuss a few more theoretical pieces before we get there? What, what do you yeah, feel? Uh, yeah, Philip, maybe I'll start with just explaining a little bit more about what the, um, uh, what paradox thinking entails, and then uh, Philip and Iraj can go deeper into the, uh, or, or go deeper into expanding the, uh, right. what it means in practice. Um, right. So this idea right. of uh, paradox thinking is essentially um, the shift from an either or mindset um, to a both and thinking, right? And, and what it means is that when you're faced, when you're confronted with uh, uh, choices or decisions um, where the positions seem to be uh, contradictory yeah, or at different right. ends, right? We're moving in different directions, yeah. right? Um, rather than think about is A or B better, yeah. right? can we come up with a way of thinking of, of, of reframing the situation so that we see, so, so that A and B uh, are not just accepted or tolerated, but they become mutually constitutive, right? They become generative. A, you need A and B, right? to create a new whole, right? A much stronger whole, right? And so the image that I have in mind is, you know, you have two different directions, A and B. If you leave them in this um, direction, or if you leave them in this state, they are a tug of, they're, 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 it's a tug of war between uh, uh, different positions, right? But if you can reframe the situation so that the relationship between them changes, right? 
and one goes this way, one goes this way. And in the middle, there's this virtuous cycle, right? What you have there is a situation that allows position A and position B to exist, um, but they're not just existing, but they're strengthening each other in a virtuous cycle. And that's where we want to get to um, with when we are thinking about paradox thinking, right? Uh, so you need to break this mindset, right? Of either or, right? And think about how we can transform both positions into uh, a, a, a new relationship. And that involves finding, right? I mean, as economists, we're taught to think about which is the best option A or B. Yeah, yeah. But this is where you need to be a little bit more creative to think about um, how do you reframe the question, reframe the issues, so that you find the interdependencies between A and B, right? We are not just tolerating, we are finding interdependencies because when we find interdependencies and we, we build on those interdependencies, that's when A and B can become a mutually generative. Okay. So conceptually, that's where we want to go. And, then, and I'll let uh, Philip and um, Iraj uh, uh, flesh out these ideas more and, and you know, explain how they see that in their practice. I, th I think what might help Faisal is, is um, you know, it was very exciting for me when, uh, when Kenneth brought in this paradox thinking. There's been a lot of writing about it, but when you apply it to our area, it becomes very, very interesting. But I think what might be helpful is for me to give you some examples of yeah. how uh, what we're talking about can actually work in the context of typical issues that families face. And uh, we're developing a lot of detail on these. I'll give a few examples in a very simple way and uh, Iraj can maybe supplement and you can ask me some questions. Uh, yeah. A very typical thing in family business is that many advisors, for example, will say to families, if you really want to last over generations and you want your business to last over generations, you need to prune the family tree. This is traditional uh, family business advice. You need to uh, get rid of the family members who are not cooperative or who are not wanting to really be fully engaged in the business. And, there, and that then translates into exit provisions in shareholders agreements and trust arrangements. It ends up in situations where family members have to choose, <clears throat> excuse me, are you in or are you out? And Is, uh, is it more economically and, driven, Philip, or is it's, it? It's, econo it's both economically driven and it's driven from the point of view of saying, we deal with a dispute by getting rid of you, by paying you some money and you go. Oh, okay. And what we're talking about is a completely different mindset. And our different mindset is families should employ a revolving door, not an exit. In other words, you're absolutely welcome to distance yourself from the family business. But that revolving door is there for you to return at any time you're ready. And certainly it's open for your children and grandchildren to come back. This transforms family constitutions. It transforms the shareholders agreement. It transforms the relationships within the family. You have families, and you'll know very well uh, from, from where you're from, your own background, Faisal, this issue. You have families that say to their kids, unless you come back to Hong Kong or Singapore or India or Pakistan or Nigeria or wherever it may be, then you, know, you can't be in the family business because we need you at home. Um, if you're a U.S. citizen, you, you cannot benefit from the trust because that's creating tax problems and reporting for our family, if you do this and that. And what Kenneth mentioned earlier about Iraj and I talking about minimizing political risk, what we were saying is in a, in a crazy world, in fact, taking advantage of the fact that you have geographical diversity among your uh, family is actually a huge strength. And there are many examples in history of why families have survived. So we celebrate that paradox. Can you be living outside of the home country and working in a completely different industry and still contribute to the family? Not only can that be accommodated by families, that can actually create greater strength for the family. And it gets, you can see, exciting for everyone in the family when you begin to discuss these things. Aging, at what age should mom and dad step away and retire, quote unquote, to make room for the younger generation. That's an either or decision. Instead, we want to do both. We want to have a phenomenal career for the family elder and really early support for that younger generation coming into the family business. It absolutely transforms things. I would be also talking about mistresses and toy boys, but my two co-authors made me change those words in the, in the, uh, in the book that we're writing. 
but I've kind the of concubines. Kept it in there. Do they con con put it concubines or well, something I've, I've, more I've kept politically it in there. correct? <laughs> I've, I've kept it in there indirectly because you know, again, that shows you either or good guy, bad guy. Yeah. Um, you know, gold digger versus the family member. But actually, if you approach these issues in a circular way and looking at paradoxes, you can accommodate and get the most benefit to the family and the family business out of every stakeholder. So it's super, super interesting. Can I, can I, I just want to clarify, Sorry, ahead, I? when you talk about both and with mistresses and toy boys, it's not having a mistresses and toy boys and spouses, right? That's that's not what we are about. Yeah. So just to <laughs> clarify, that's not that's not the that's an incorrect application. Philip, of, Philip, this guy's this guy's got the footnotes going, Philip. We're gonna yeah. the, the, the transcriber of this webinar is gonna be a little bit stressed. these guys, these guys are keeping me in check, don't worry. <laughs> It's okay. So I just want to ask Philip, I mean, before Iraj jumps in. So when you say the revolving door, so you're telling me that a family would be able to have the right to exit and re-enter as a shareholder in the next generation, and the shareholders agreement would would create ways of doing that? Is is that what I'm hearing correctly? So let me expand on that. The answer is yes, but I think it's worth explaining a little bit more. Yeah. You're a member of your family, and the message the family is giving is not you're in or you're out. The message of, that the family gives is you're a member of this family. And as a member of this family, no matter what you do, you're going to have, for example, health care, basic education taken care of. Oh, okay. your, your, your children will be well taken care of. And then the more distant you are, you, we still love you. You're still part of our family, and we want to support what you're doing. And then the closer you get, the revolving door allows you to re-enter different ways of contributing to the family. And we very much are advocating clarity to all family members of what do they get. You and I have had discussions, Pezel, in the past about expectations and making sure that expectations are, are, are matched in terms of the family. So we very much advocate that everyone knows what their financial position is. We encourage the financial independence of the younger generation. And the revolving door is really to show that the door is always open to get closer, to get further. And there's a clarity of what your position is at every point in time. Um, we have also the concepts uh, of a family bank, a way that the family can support the entrepreneurial endeavors of the younger generation, which may not seem to match the family business. But what is the family business? Is the family business what the family is about? Or is it the family and the family business is part of the history of the family and may evolve? A business that is attractive today may not be the business of the future. So uh, it really gets interesting when you, when, you, when you look at this. I want to touch on that later on the entrepreneurial. I have an entrepreneurial fund and I was challenged about the entrepreneurial fund, which you spoke to. And we'll, we'll come back to that. And I want to ask you, what you think of you know that structure? Go ahead, Iraj. So, so thank thank you, Faisal. I, I think the uh, and thank you for getting conversation back on on, on track. I was a bit concerned <laughs> a few minutes ago, <laughs> but I but I stayed on mute. That's my discipline. So I, I I think that the I think we are at a stage where the mindset that is required. Yeah is an adaptive mindset because being reliant on this is the way that we have always done it and it served us well may indeed or there's a likelihood that it will not be enough to for the for the next stage so and i think you know COVID has created it's pressed the pause button for many people who have taken for the first time an integrated view of health and wealth. Otherwise, many of the patriarchs and matriarchs and founders that we know seem to think you know, they are alpha personalities and they will they will live eternally, but you know, not, not the case. And that conversation about health and wealth and the future is one which next generations need to be absolutely part of, as well as older generations, because no one in a family is past their sell-by date. Everyone can be additive and you need to step back, as Philip said, from the business. Everyone is a member of the family and that never changes. So why wouldn't you want to make the most of everybody 
And that is the human capital dimension, which is embedded in circularity. So what's happened is during the pandemic in every family that you talk to around the world, if sustainability, which is a subset of circularity, if sustainability itself was not on family agendas, it has moved much higher up the agenda and the younger generations are driving that conversation. So part of that, if it's going to be reflected in the way the family manages its own context, is actually about purpose. What are we for? And we is not just the business, we as a family. And the conversations, therefore, which we're encouraging are really think about your purpose and what you stand for. Because if the family itself doesn't survive further disruptions, then the good work it does in, in the community, the excellent businesses they may run, won't continue. And, and we come at this from perspective that actually family, uh, you know, wealth ownership and wealth owners by and large, though not always as we know, uh, are a force for good and need to be uh, need to be an active voice with with other uh, you know with 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 with, with governments with regulators or with the wider world in terms of moving the world along and particularly of course in emerging markets as you know the GDP that families own is is very significant so I think that uh, this is a uh, it's an opportunity and let me pause after this for families to be much more joined up perhaps than they have been and to take a slightly less patriarchal view uh, than they might have relied on in the past. All right, so I'm listening a few words. So adaptive, agile, so I'm thinking anti-fragility, right? You're talking about anti-fragility versus fragility, but it's interesting, right? The world is going more into control, predictability. I'm talking about the governments and all the things mm -hmm. they're doing. And you're saying we need to go the other way because we need to be able to be adaptive and agile. Now, in, in, when, when COVID started, to the families we serve, we said, this is what we've been preparing for. We've been building the physical muscle, the mental emotional muscle, and the relational muscle to be prepared for the unexpected, which was COVID. So now what I'm hearing, and please correct me as we go, and I wanna understand, so what is the muscles that we need to build to create the circular economy? You're talking about conversations, communication, mindset, purpose. So what are the muscles that we need to build to be able to have this adaptability and embrace, which is one of the words, an integrative nature, if, if you know, as, as we go, it'd be, it'd be good to understand, right? What are those pieces that will strengthen our ability for longevity or sustainability? It, you know, I think every question that a family faces, however basic, can be addressed by saying, let's look at trying to achieve both, never that either or, as Kenneth would say. Okay. And I'll just give you a little example. You know, uh, mom and dad have a, a very important collection of jewelry that's passed down through the family. Yeah. And a big conundrum for families is, okay, who do we pass this jewelry to? Yeah. And in our wills or otherwise. And, and what I've seen in many of the families that I work with are, are very divisive situations that arise where the parents haven't made clear who gets what. In oh. some cases, the parents will say, oh, it only goes to, uh, to my daughters and granddaughters. It can never go to spouses. And, you, and, then, and then kids oh, fight about who gets what and all that. If you look at our kind of thinking and you think of circularity, circularity how can we achieve both with all of this? Well, maybe the, ju the jewelry or the artwork or whatever, whatever it is should be in a form of trust yeah. where all family members can use the jewelry in very agreed kind of circumstances, yeah. but it's always kept together for the family going forward into the future. You no longer have this, it has to go to the daughter or the son, or it has to go to this daughter and not that daughter. It's not either or, they all get it. Everyone enjoys it. It goes to all the grandchildren. It, it, it gives you such a relief when you, when you come to this way of thinking to deal with the paradoxes that families face. And the examples are unlimited. Okay. Amazing. I, I, I think the, and uh, in, in addition, it, it is about, if we live in an environment where it's, it's very easy to think that you have the answers, but just actually thinking, is there another way of approaching something, which is what Philip is referring to, I think is, is, is fundamental. And 
And what we were talking about before we uh, were live was about the in, in individuation and actually in, in, in families amongst younger, younger generations in particular, there is a desire to do their own thing, to be themselves, to realize their individual purpose, but actually bringing the conversation, you can, and everyone needs to realize something for themselves, otherwise they'll be eternally frustrated, but what is the collective purpose, which is not necessarily at the expense of the individual purpose. Yeah. So the, 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 fa the, fa the family, in terms of their willingness to adapt and have an adaptive mindset, is actually by listening to each other and not rushing to those solutions that may have seemed appropriate in the past. Some may indeed be relevant, but let's validate them for today's environment and looking ahead. And I think that is really the, and, and actually the thing that I always say is that families, each, every family is different. Families have to manage their own context. That's the thing that's going to be interesting, right? Because most, most families are looking at other families and how they succeed and how they did things. But it's a, from a historical context. And what you're saying is that what did work may not work. Let's now not go and or, let's go what if both are possible and how can we make both work? Exactly. Right? And, and coming exactly. back, like for example, I'll bring in the entrepreneurial fund you know, one of the individual we both know, um, Philip, um, I was discussing the entrepreneurial fund and he challenged it and he said, look, I would take a certain slice of that amount where he or she has access to it with no questions asked. Okay, obviously not to go party and all that, but to build something with no questions asked because even myself, right, I started with the traditional business, right? Importation, distribution, et cetera, which, my father could relate to, example, right? And he gave us a loan. If imagine I had started genetic care when I began, right? It might have been a very different conversation. And I can guarantee it would have been. He would have been like, What are you talking about? So the, the individual challenged me and said, Maybe there's a slice of that entrepreneurial fund that should be no questions asked. I don't know. What, yeah, so so I think I think what you've said. So so the short answer, and I'll give you the long answer. The short answer is that's a good idea. The the long answer, and I think it'll be helpful for those who don't know what you're talking about, is to maybe step back for a minute and to talk about what we're what we're dealing with when we talk about an entrepreneurial fund or a family bank and how this relates to circularity. Um, in many families, it's inevitable that one child or the other child will need more money from time to time. You know, one is more independent financially, the other is less dependent on the family. One may be working in a good profession that's paying well, the other may be more of an entrepreneur. So what happens if the daughter says, mom, dad, you know, I have this business idea, can I get some dough? Uh, so the parents are very nice, they give the daughter some dough, the business goes down the tubes. Yeah. Um, so in that circumstance, the other kids, the other siblings may say, well, you know, is this really fair? You know, one of, our, one of the siblings is being favored and maybe repeatedly as business after business idea fails, um, is that really fair? It creates strain. What happens if the business the daughter is creating turns into the next Facebook and she becomes a billionaire? The other kids may feel, well, wasn't that our family money put into that business? You know, what's in it for us? You know, yeah. it was our family money. So this notion of family bank and as it relates to circularity and entrepreneurial fund, as you put it, it's really all designed to create a sense of fairness and also to focus on regenerative capitalism, to focus on regenerating the family business. Yeah. How do you best do that? There's no one answer. It's exactly as Iraj says, you know, it's different for every family. What is important is the dialogue within the family yeah. and the fact that they all have a common understanding of what the deal is. So just an example of what the deal is, is to be saying in the family, look, if any of you kids have a good business idea, um, the family is happy to consider supporting it. Uh, but here's the deal. When we invest a million dollars in your new idea, 200,000 of that, for example, is an investment by our family in that business. 80% of the investment, 800,000 in my example, is a loan to you to the kid. If your business fails, that loan doesn't need to be repaid now. It's going to come out of your future inheritance. We loaned you the 800,000. 
you lost it, it comes out of your inheritance. The 200,000 that we invested, we've lost that money. But if the business flies and is really successful, you own 80% of it, the family owns 20. And before you can sell your 80% to anyone else, you need to give us a right of first refusal because we might wanna capture that business within our family. The whole idea is to have this kind of clarity. Now, what you've introduced now is to say, well, maybe there should be some money there so that a kid like Faisal could get money to do a crazy business like genetic hair and with no questions asked. Why not? Both and, you know, Kenneth would say both and. And, and so we allocate a certain amount of money. You can do whatever you want with that money in an entrepreneurial way. Uh, if you want more, then there are different criteria. It doesn't really matter. What matters is the conversation, the clarity, and the buy-in by all family members and getting them excited about this. Yeah, I mean, I, I had the, I mean, we've had the conversation with the boys and, and the idea is, I mean, there's, you know, three funds for three companies each, right? And, and a cross ownership. And that was an co interesting conversation to discuss cross ownership, right? And it was to keep the majority with the founder of that idea, but to at least hedge your position, right? First, they were like, yeah, but why would you say, you don't know who's going to hit what? You know, you may hit it the first round. He may hit it the second round. And what a great conversation. Wasn't that a great conversation yeah. with your kids? You yeah. know, it, so th that's the whole idea here. That's yeah. the whole idea here. Yeah. But I haven't, I, I haven't discussed the, uh, the, the, you know, no questions asked one yet. So that's, that, that's going to be interesting. No, because you just, you know, and it's, it's just interesting to see what percentage, right? Do you, do you create that cross ownership? Did it, you know, is it going to be, you know, will it work? All the things. Go ahead, Kenneth, Iraj, any, I mean, go ahead, Ken. Well, I, I just had a general comment as I'm, you know, as I'm seeing this uh, conversation progress. And what I see uh, happening is that, you know, th th there is this shift um, uh, when, when, we, when we talk about circularity and paradox thinking, there's a shift in um, our underlying logics of, the, of how we govern a family and, and, and even run the business. Right. Um, from one that is based on uh, a logic of exclusion uh, to a logic of inclusion. Um, and I, I'm not to say that we should all, that we should just shift the other way, you know, that, that, that you need to draw, you do need to draw boundaries. But yeah. I think in some ways, um, the logic of exclusion has, uh, has, has, has dominated the way we think. Yeah. Right. And, and when you start thinking, for, for me, what really gets me excited about this idea um, about uh, uh, I mean, within the context of family and the business uh, down the road is that um, as family, this is like the natural place for you to practice um, a, a applying this logic of inclusion, right? Because you're, you're sticking with the people and then you're changing the structures to allow different forms, different, well, not different forms of people, but different people, right? To be a part of the organization, the family organization. Now, when you think about the modern day organization, it's run based on the logic of exclusion, right? And what that means is that we have an ideal form of the organization, right? That's designed in such a way to maximize profit. And if you fit in this, this yeah. form, great. If you don't, you're fired, all right? And that form of capitalism uh, in a way has, you know, we, we can see it causing the problems that we are facing today. Right. And so I think there's a broader shift that's underway, right? Um, and, 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 and I think it starts with the family, for families to practice applying more of this logic of inclusion, right? And then taking that experience, applying inclusion into the organization so that they can run the organizations, not in the typical fashion, right? Where, you know, if you fit, you're in, you don't fit, we kick you out but thinking about how uh, we can build more inclusive organizations um, at, on the broader level, right? And, and, and so, I'm, I'm, I, you know, for me, when I think about sustainability and uh, the role of uh, business families and family run uh, enterprises and, how, and, and their role in the future of uh, sustainability, you know, I'm very excited by it because I, I, I see the problems that families uh, are dealing with as uh, potential solutions uh, to new ways of organizing in the future. Professor, let me let me jump in there and pick up on this uh, on Ken's excellent point on on inclusion in the in the family con context that we're discussing because it's actually it's a much much bigger word otherwise 
And uh, if, if you think about uh, family business owners who look at their, the strategy for the business, and let's say that in the next 25 years with the advanced digital, an industrial conglomerate is actually going to need to change significantly the way it operates. Well, what skills do younger family members need to be equipped with to be relevant, not to serve the family today, but in 20, 30 years time? And is there an expectation that the, that the organization will still be owner operated? Or are you preparing people to become part of an owner's board? which and to understand governance and not necessarily deep dive into the operations of the existing business. So this is sort of future proofing the family organization and the assets of the family. Indeed, going back to overall purpose, what does the family stand for? Families often don't even understand their own values. There's a lot of purpose washing today. People are desperate to have a narrative and they don't have it. So be true to yourself and say, I want to develop something. There's a lot of second generation wealth in Asia, for instance. So good, have the question, is, is making more money just enough? If that's the answer, maybe for some, I hope it's not for everybody. But actually, what is that purpose and how is it reached? Because there will be members of the family who may have no interest in the business or no capability, but who could be hugely helpful as a voice for the family with community work yeah. with and, and building other partnerships and the reputation because actually at the end of the day what do families want by and large they wish to continue by and large and they wish to have a good reputation so again they can help themselves much more through this process of inclusion listening respecting individuation and the and and you know and Kenneth's you know paradox you know it's and or it does you know it's why not both so I think uh, there is a uh, uh, so let, let me let me pause there but I think this this, this in, in, inclusion is really what this is all about. So Philip, oh, let's let, let's put the two Asians a little bit on there. Uh, so can I, yeah, can, I, can I just make a quick yeah. comment um, yeah. just in response to what Iraj has uh, yeah. mentioned? Yeah. Uh, so, so, so I'm also reacting to uh, what Iraj has said, and also to uh, uh, Stephanie's uh, question in the Q and A. Yeah. Because you can really see, I, you know, I like Stephanie's uh, question because you can really see the tension between exclusion and inclusion, right? Uh, in some ways, we have to exclude, right? But, um, but, but we want to be mindful about that process, right? So, it, it, I'm not saying that we should be inclusive of everyone but neither should we be exclusive of and, and, and just accept the parameters of exclusion as it is, right? I mean, these are socially constructed boundaries and it's something that we have to uh, have that conversation about. And that brings me to the point that Iraj has made about purpose, right? So when you think about where do we draw the boundaries for exclusion and inclusion, right? And that's where purpose comes into the picture, right? Um, because that helps us identify who we may consider as family and um, who's not, um, uh, uh, what kind of revolving door that we want. Um, and so, you know, all of these are interconnected, uh, if you will. So just, can you give an example? Like, I mean, both of you are in, are in you know, Raj, your generation is, what is, what's the generation after 200 years? That's a lot of generation. Yes, Faisal, you pick a number. We can't hear you. We lost you. No, I said, Fessel, you, you pick a number and let's move on. <laughs> okay. now, so the question is, is that, that how have you been able, for example, you obviously had a purpose, a vision, or whatever values in your respective families. As you brought this concept in, if you have, if you haven't, it's fine. How did the, the spirit of the, of the purpose shift? as you started to think with this mindset that you're referring to, whether it's paradox, whether it's inclusion, because then the depth and the spirit changes, right? It's not the words, it's the spirit. So did you feel that shift? Could you feel the energy and the, the, the whole um, system shift in terms of the whole family system as you did it? Or, 
what, what was your experience? Uh, so is that from, Kevin, right. you go first, you go. Yeah, uh, so, all right, so, so I'll share my personal journey. Um, and so the mindset shift, and, and so this is why I qualified that, you know, the, the, the shift starts from the individual and then um, diffuses out, right? And, and so for me, it starts with myself, right? You know, as, uh, um, and, and so with my uh, family, you know, it's, uh, I'm, I'm the outlaw, um, who, trying to be the in-law or maybe the in-law who's become the outlaw. Um, but it started with me thinking about my role in the business right? or, or within the family, right? I'm part of the family. Am I part of the business? Um, am I just like, you know, outside? But thinking more about, okay, how can I, in a way, still contribute to purpose, right? And our family's purpose goes beyond just the business, right? You know, it's, it's about our role in society, our role in the community. And so when I start to think in those terms and, and, and I see and I look at the position that I'm in as an academic, right? Then it, it becomes very clear, right? The work that I do kind of contributes to that purpose. And so within my teaching, uh, within the courses, uh, within my network as well, you know, I'm drawing on um, uh, uh, the, the family uh, for support as well. And in some ways, I'm also um, uh, uh, looking at leveraging on these resources to, uh, 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 to support the family as well. So it starts from me, right? This is not something I go around because I, I know my place in the family, right? As an outlaw, you don't go around telling everyone that this is how you should be thinking. Um, are there any of them on this call right now? No, not good. Yeah, well, but they, you know, they can watch the recording, so be careful. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I love my family. I just want to say that I, I wasn't talking about myself. It was a hypothetical situation, a, a, a common friend. Yeah, but it, it, it starts with me. You know, I'm, I'm not trying to change any of their mindsets. It starts with me. And, and putting that into practice, you know, and I think when the family starts seeing you as a, a, a part of the ecosystem, um, and then that's how the, uh, uh, the mindset uh, shift can start to uh, diffuse um, uh, uh, across uh, uh, people. And that's can, why I asked, you, right? It's, it's Faisal, about, what, what, yeah, go ahead, sorry. Go ahead, Philip. Go ahead. I, I was gonna say, you know, what Kenneth has just said, it, it, it's, it, it, it is truly transformational. And I've been yeah. working yeah. using these principles more recently with some of the families that I work with. And yeah. the most difficult questions about, you know, how do we deal with a child who's really been very difficult for the family? Do we exclude them from the agreements? Do we do all that? As soon as you start talking about this open door, the revolving door, there's a light, a lightening of yeah. the weight on the shoulder of all yeah. family members. It's incredible and very important, as Irash has touched on, um, the individualization or self-actualization of yeah. each and every family member. It becomes so exciting when you're not only talking about the we, but yeah. what you're doing is you're saying, unless the I is very, very strong, the we is weakened by that weakness of the eye. It's when you have both this enormous sense of I'm being supported for my individual desires and needs. And by virtue of that, I'm able to contribute way more to the we of the family. And again, I like always coming back to something concrete. The more families that are families in business and wealth owning families think about providing clarity and financial independence doesn't mean zillions of dollars, but it means a clarity of financial independence for all family members. This strengthens the I and it strengthens the we. In so many families I work with, there are kids in their 50s and 60s. Yes, we call them kids because they're still financially dependent on their parents for gifts and, and money that they need. And there's a lack of clarity on who gets what when. And the more we address that, even with relatively reasonable amounts, a clarity that education, healthcare is taken care of, these kind of things are taken care of, already that contributes to this financial independence, the strengthening of the eye, and the support of self-actualization, that the mission is that each individual in the family should achieve what their best capacity is to achieve, not financially, not in the family business, but for them individually in whatever area that might involve. Yeah, we were having the conversation before we started. Remember the, the me within the we, 
And in Asia, most of us grew up, including myself, the me didn't exist. There was no me, it was all we. And to be able to, like even when I wrote the book, I mean, when I write, had to write I, I literally was feeling sick because it didn't exist. And I'm 53, I wrote the book when I'm 50. That's, that's pretty strange, right? And here you're talking about, you know, how do we create that support system for the I and all the eyes create the we and the strength of the I is the we, not just the few eyes within the we, right? Because that's what was happening. Few eyes were carrying the we, right? And now you're saying one plus one plus one plus one is 1,111, right? Not just one plus one equals 11, because that's what we were creating. If I'm exactly, here. exactly. I, I, I think you know, the, 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 we, the we, we starts early and like, like, like Kenneth, so, you know, I, I, I grew up in Asia, I grew up in Bangladesh, I, uh, but I spent 25 years not joining the family business and I led my own life, uh, uh, happily so, but the purpose about who I am and who we are as a family, which was the much bigger the we, it was entirely consistent. So the, the way I live my life okay. was the way that a member of this family would be expected to live their life wherever they are. And so my purpose and my contribution to community, the work that I did for about three decades with, uh, with the arts, with Shakespeare's Globe, for 15 years with eye health and with seeing is believing, which is we did globally, continue to work on that. Those were very consistent with the things that the family had always supported education and had supported eye care. So I had knew these were things that were important and I'd learned early. And so and that I gravitated towards these sorts of things and I had an opportunity to do things on a different stage. But very interestingly, well before uh, Philip and I had the opportunity of getting to know uh, Professor Kenneth, uh, on, on this call, we had in my own family experienced some paradox thinking and actually come out ahead as a result of it, which is when I went back to the family fold, it was about 10 years ago and uh, joined the, the board uh, where, I, where I serve currently, there had really been no concept of a family member not operating a business and not actually being present primarily in Bangladesh. I live, I lived, I live in London. And I frankly, my experience, my professional experience has primarily been in financial services, but not in industrial and consumer businesses, which is what uh, the uh, with our, what our operating businesses uh, are in. And the uh, and of course, if we had, if the view had been that this is how we've always done it and there's no room for you at the inn, then it would have been, there would be no inclusion. I would be out. So in a way, we found an ideal way, which is actually I'm a non-executive board member and I can contribute to a lot of the thinking. And, uh, and I, by the same token, I'm very grateful that my cousins are there doing the great job that they're doing and we're better together. And on things like purpose, that was the glue that, that always remained because we were always actually thinking, we, we had a sense of what was important in the world and we still share that. So there is a lot of cohesion with that, which, which, which helps, uh, yeah, which, which I think certainly we found helpful. And I think, you know, as Kenneth indicated, others do as well. Hiraj told me that uh, one of his kids, I think his daughter was asked the question of, you know, is, is the family business important to you? And this is a daughter who's grown up, you know, in England or whatever. And if I recall, Hiraj, what you said to me was, her response was, yes, it's important to me because I know it's important to daddy. And, yes. and, and if that's correct, you know, that's a good example of what we're talking about here, because who knows where that daughter is going to go in the future and yeah. what she's going to contribute to this family business. And what would have been lost if Iraj was not still, albeit in a different geography, part of this circle of the family? And it's, and it's just so interesting. And you come back to what Kenneth said earlier about inclusion and exclusion. And I want to make a very important point here. Families, exactly as Kenneth said, 
are best positioned to lead in the world to show how this can work and be examples to non-family businesses of how they can do yes. this. But families are better placed to make this happen. And it, it's just so, so fascinating and so exciting. And, and I know we're going to run out of time soon. One of the things that we've also worked on, which is for me very interesting personally, is how cultural and religious principles come into all of this. It's not either we use Sharia principles or not, either we uh, have the older son get everything or not. It's how do we benefit from Sharia principles? There are many principles, and I've been working a lot on this. There are many principles within Sharia that actually help us on this circular path. So it becomes super interesting when you discuss this within families and also families where you may have some family members who are much more, usually the older generation, much more fixed on using these traditional principles and the younger generation resist it. But yeah. when they begin to see it in the context of circularity, it's making the conversations really interesting. Do you feel that, that that communication gap between generations with this new way and paradox is becoming a lot more fluid? Is, is that what I'm hearing? Totally. And also the yes. competition, also the competition among siblings and the and the and the tension, the natural tension between the older generation and the younger generation. You know, when do you come in? When do we yeah. exit? There are no exits. Yeah. There are no exits. Yeah. And and even with the in-laws, outlaws, huh, Kenneth, that's that's also that line is no more, the defense is very short or non-existent. Is is are we feeling that also? Because in Many families, the in-laws, outlaws feel a bit, they don't know their place, right? It's kind of like, I am, but I'm not. And, you yeah, know, clarity, do clarity, don't waste resources. Don't waste resources. It doesn't mean do things that are not smart. It doesn't mean, yeah. you know, risk the family's assets. Not at all. That's not what we're talking about, but don't waste resources. And there are plenty of examples of families in Hong Kong and elsewhere where the in-laws saved the day. There are yeah. lots of examples of that where the in-laws save the day if they were properly uh, encouraged and if they were properly, you know, if there was clarity about their role. Uh, no, no comment, Faisal. No comment. <laughs> Iraj, he's playing the, he's pleading the Fifth Amendment. Huh? Yeah. This is getting interesting. Now he's being truly Asian, Iraj. <laughs> it's starting to sink in that this is recorded. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I wanted to make one comment and, and, you know, I'm mindful about time as well. Uh, actually, I don't know how much time we have. Do we end at eight or? We... Sorry. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're at a few minutes. Don't worry. Don't okay. worry. Yeah. But, you know, this, you know, I wanted to go back to the paradox of the I and the we. Um, and, and, and to stress that this is not something that we're making up, right? Just to make it sound good. But you actually see it in nature. So when you think about the survival of species, right? Uh, species with a particular... Uh, I mean, a, a species survives not because it is strong, right? Strong is uh, a value uh, that we attach to a characteristic after the fact, right? But in the moment, as you see the species trying to adapt to the environment, right? It's strong. I mean, it survives because of something called requisite variety amongst its population, right? And that's really a story of diversity, right? We, we don't know beforehand what's strong, what's weak, what's functional, what's not. Right, that only happens after the fact. And so when you apply it to a family and longevity and succession, it's the same principle, right? We need to have, uh, we need to be inclusive because at the end of the day, that's what's gonna enable the family as a unit to survive. And that applies to our organizations as well. It's, it's Man, am I, gonna, am, I gonna steal, am I gonna steal that idea in every conversation I now have with kids within the families I work with? Yeah, and please. That's so, it, this requisite variety thing, I've not you know, heard the term, but yeah. do you see how exciting it is, Faisal? You're yeah. sitting with a group of kids in yeah. a family that is in business and you start talking about requisite variety in the animal world yeah. and how the species survives. You show some slides of that. And what you say is we need diversity. We need each of you to build yourselves into requisite variety. Yeah. Man, that's so exciting. I love it. I love it. I know, but what's really funny, Philip, that in the investment world, everybody did it. But in the family world, we're behind. And normally we lead, right? This is the first time where we're following, 
right? Because everybody said we need to diversify, we need to do all of this, but how well did we do it within the family as a human system? Iraj? I, I, I think, and then stepping back slightly from this, I think with, with, with families, one of the issues, and it's one, one of my hobby horses, is that actually the taxonomy that is often used in the investment world or the sort of corporate world, families view as alien to them and not applicable. This is corporate talk. But actually, if we can adapt the language, yeah. then of course, families should think about the world through a risk framework, through their risk okay. appetite, through their you know, risk tolerance. Yeah. That's a very sensible frame to have around this whole discussion. So I think that's, you know, and those are some of the things that, you know, that, that we've been discussing, uh, that, you know, the three of us as well, and, and will, will evolve. But I think that's very helpful because it's, it's fundamental. If you, once you identify that, you can work within it, but you need a frame. And, and as Kenneth said, we don't know what is going to be relevant, but not only relevant, but strong, right? Mm -hmm. To take the family to the next gen, like Philip mentioned, it could be an in-law that saved the day. It could have been, you know, the next Facebook that you that you spoke to that the next gen built. We just don't know, right? So why not hedge our position by following what you're saying, which is a circular economy of inclusion, to hedge ourselves for longevity, right? I mean, it it makes sense from every angle, right? So, I mean, if if I'm hearing correctly, you, you absolutely know you 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 have, and uh, and I think it. Why, why wouldn't a family which has an ambition and a vision build in some optionality for itself? 100%. So what I'd like to do, um, we've reached our time. I'd like each one of you, if you don't mind, to, to share a takeaway or a reminder or, or just something maybe that we, we, we did talk about or we didn't talk about just to you know, have people reflect as, as they go out. There's another question. Sorry, and five of that. Okay, that's fine. Right? So anybody, whoever wants to go first, one, one each, if you don't mind. Philip, I think they're waiting for you. Okay, I was reading the question, so I wasn't listening to you. Okay, Sorry. So, <laughs> so what last reminder or takeaway or something we didn't touch on would you like people to kind of reflect on as, as, as we bring this to a close? I mean, we could go on for hours. I'll, I'll say, I'll, and, I'll do and that. Nobody's yeah. left, by the way, so that's yeah, quite I'll, interesting. I'll do that in the context of, of trying to answer some of the questions that have been posted. Um, you know, the, the takeaway is how exciting it is to think about, you know, this notion of not wasting resources. And, yeah. and, it, and, and it helps you in questions like one of the questions posted, um, you know, the definition of family and being clear. You know, I'm not suggesting by any means to be dangerous People are always worried about, you know, being over-inclusive of who's yeah. in the family, spouses, adopted children, illegitimates, et cetera. But there are ways to address this yeah. where, you know, you think about what's best, you know, for the well-being of everyone within the family. And this can be balanced with cultural and social attitudes and otherwise. And one of the other questions, you know, which relates to, you know, so many families have a we mentality, but they behave like an I. Um, dialogue within the family you know you know the families that are fake then there are a lot of them out there who say one thing and do another you know it's just a very common thing the more there is open dialogue and the more there are you know thinkers who can come in and challenge what the family is thinking about in a very fun open way you know and and we hope we've kind of tried to show that today all three of us are fun and, uh, you know, that, and, and that's the idea, is, is looking at these things in this kind of context openly. So uh, that, that would be my takeaway. But don't waste resources. Enjoy the paradoxes. Celebrate the paradoxes. Families have massive potential. Lovely. Thank you, Philip. So, Iraj, do you mind if I jump in or do you want to go first? Or, okay, I'll let you close. Um, so, so I, I like uh, Leilani's uh, question. Uh, it really got me thinking uh, as much as I um, uh, uh, talk about this we mentality, you know, as a parent of kids, I can see it so many times that it's really about also me imposing my expectations um, on my kids. And, and so, you know, your comment got me thinking, am I a fake eye? Am I fake? Not a fake. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I think my response to the question is, uh, uh, first of all, 
I, I think using the language, uh, uh, the, the term, the terminology of a fake eye uh, might uh, 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 generate resistance. Because when I think about my, my the, the way I behave and you know, the, the way I especially uh, react to my kids, you know, I'm not trying to put on a front, but it really comes down uh, to love, you know, how you're, you know, what I, you know, what, what you, you're really just expecting the best, what you think is the best uh, for your child, right? And so that's why I think um, how people tend to fixate more on the I rather than the we. But if we go back to the essence of what it means to be family, and that's really love, right? And you love, and, and, and the love comes not from the family, like I love my family, but I love the individuals within the family. And in order for me to love the individual within the family, I have to, in some ways, let them blossom. And there's a question that I, um, you know, constantly have as a reminder when I'm interacting with my kids as well, to refrain from being at all about the I and the me, right? And, 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 and for them to become, and for us to become we's as well. So I hope that uh, helps, uh, Lilani. Great question, thank you. Thank you, Kenna. Iraj, no pressure. Uh, I would, uh, since, since I, I've been invited by Ken to, to close, but I will pass the mic back to you, so don't worry. <laughs> um, it is, is very, very, very simply, I would say to, to everyone who's on the call today and to all families who may listen to this, if, Things, if you look at history, things change very fast and no one is prepared. So if you only do one thing now, just ask yourselves as a family, is there anything that we could be doing differently that would enable us to continue with our heads held up as we look forward into the generations ahead? That's all. Perfect. Love it. Thank you, Raj. So what I'm hearing, and I, I, I want to thank every one of you for, for, for the sharings, for the incredible conversation. And, and it's really about a shift in mindset, a shift in the thinking of the ecosystem, right? The whole family system and the human system within that, right? The individual within that and how they're correlated, how they're interdependent and how they coexist, right? And, and that paradox thinking of inclusion and not exclusion, and really looking at, you know, we don't know what tomorrow strength is needed to be able to adapt, right, and be agile in the coming world, which, as Iraji said, is changing so rapidly, right? So, again, thank you very much, all of you. Thank you. Thank you for everyone for, for joining us. And uh, we'll see you next week. We have Stefan, which all of you know. Thank you, Philip, for the introduction, who's going to talk about trust. But again, the relationships and the communication behind the structures that are created. So again, taking what you're, what we spoke to today into you know, the structural format of trust or foundations or whatever the structure families choose to have. So thank you again, guys. Have a bon appetit thank you, for those in Europe. Thank thanks, you. Faisal. Many, many thanks, Faisal. Thank you. thank you everyone for thank being you. with us and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye-bye, thank you.